one of the reasons they, the people of Canaan were scared. And Canaan, what's another name for the land of Canaan? Some of my older kids beside Ian, help me. No? Remember? The promised land. That's right. It's the promised land. Who promised the land to who? Abby? Okay, way back, way before this, somebody promised this land, said, this land will be yours. Who promised the land to who? Me. Stephen? Uh, Just one of them. Who promised, who said, this land will be yours? God. God. That's right. Okay, so we got that part. God said to who, to which people, that the land of Canaan would be their land. Okay, maybe that way we've got some more ideas here. Who? The two spies. Not the two spies. The two spies were from what people? Silas? Jericho? No, not Jericho. Do you know it, Stephen? Uh, no. No, okay. That's right. Aaron? The little tents. The little tents, <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is the camp of the Israelites. That's, pretty, that's true. God promised Israel that this land would be theirs. He promised it to Abraham and to Jacob. And another name for Jacob was Israel. And, um, and to Isaac, he promised that. And the people were in Egypt, and God brought them out of Egypt. And now they were just outside the land that God had promised them. And God, in, to the, in the lesson that we have today, God is going to tell them to do something, another something, that's impossible. They were, they are in these tents right here. And what is between them in their tents and the land of Canaan? What is between? Water. What's between? Water. Do you know the name? What? what? It's not the Dead Well, the Dead Sea is down here, but they are up here. What's between them and, between them and the A land? Ripple. A river. It's called the Jordan River. And when they, when, when they were there, at this time, the Jordan River was really full. You know how the river, the river right here, the Calumet River, sometimes it's low, sometimes it's really full? Yeah. 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 Well, this was before they had, like, levees and stuff like that. So the Jordan River was really full. And when the Jordan River is full, what is it, when a river is full, what does it do? It overflows. And it gets wider and wider and wider and wider. Right? And so the Jordan River is really, really wide. And the children of Israel are on this side. And the land that God promised them is on this side. And God said to Joshua to tell the people, um, get ready because in tomorrow, God is going to have us go into the land of Canaan. He's going to do something mighty and miraculous. So, the people, they got everything packed up. They put their tents together because they lived in tents, right? They lived in tents, and they packed up their tents, and they got all their animals and got ready to, to go. And what did they do um, with, where did they worship? Where did the children of Israel worship? In, in the wilderness, where did they worship? Do you remember? They That's who they worship. They worship God. Older kids, help me out. Where did they worship? They built something, and then that's where they worship. In the man, not a temple. In the wilderness, that they moved it around. They would pick it up and move it. Remember? It sounds like it's like a temple, but it's a tabernacle. Remember the tabernacle? That we don't use that word. You were about to say that. So they had the tabernacle, and what was in the in the inside, in the inside, in the inside of the tabernacle? There was a certain what we call a piece of furniture. We wouldn't sit on it like furniture, but there was something inside, inside. In the, in the Holy of Holies, there was a piece of furniture. What was it? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. Very good, yeah. And it was the mercy seat, and the mercy seat sat on top of this box that they call the Ark, right? The Ark of the Covenant. And the mercy seat's on there, and how did, the Ark, how did they move the Ark of the Covenant around? When it was time to move it. Do you remember what they would do with it? How did they move it? Silas. There's two poles on each side of it, and two is on each side of the back of it, and pulled up the poles, and then in the front there was two men. Right, so they carried the 
Ark of the Covenant on poles, right? They didn't put it on a cart and let it be carried around, uh, carted around by animals. They carried it on poles. And so, Joshua, everybody was doing their thing. The Levites were covered, the priests were covering the pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. The Levites were packing everything up. And the priests got the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, ready to go. And Joshua said to said to the priest, well, he said to all the people, we're going to go across the river tomorrow, and we're going to follow the Ark of the Covenant, but covenant, but leave a half a mile between you and the Ark of the Covenant so that everybody can see it. So it's got to be a long way away so we can see, because every, if everybody's crowded around, we can't see it, so we don't, won't know where to go. So leave a half a mile between you and the Ark of the Covenant, and we're going to go across the river. Now, how are we going to get across the river? God said, you're going to go across the river. It's impossible to get across the river, isn't it? But God can take care of things that are impossible, can't he? He said, we're going to follow the ark. When the priests that are carrying the ark, when they step into the water, God is going to push the water back. And so, the next day, they took off. All the people are watching, and the priests are carrying the ark, and they're getting close to the water, and they're getting close to the water. Did anything change? No. no. The water's just going by, and it's a long way across the water, and, and it's going fast, it's going by, and it's going by, and it's going by, and the priests are walking up to the water. Did anything change? No. But then the priest put their foot, they put their foot right in the water, and I don't even think their feet got wet. Because as soon as they stepped into the water, what happened? All what God what, what God said was going to happen. All the water was rolled back, like, a, like you would roll up a sleeping bag almost. It was rolled back for a long way. In fact, the Bible tells us the, the, this, the, the places where there was no water, where there used to be a river, was 16 miles long. You know how far 16 miles is? Some of your older ones think about it. It's right here. We are six miles, only six miles from Illinois. Okay? So what are the 16 miles to Portage? You know where Portage is, your older ones? So that's the river was rolled back for 16 miles, and the priest went out and stood in the middle of the river, but there was no river. They stood in the middle of what was the river, and there was, and they didn't. And the people of Israel walked across the river, and they walked. Do you think they walked through um, um, puddles of water? Yeah. No. Do you think they walked through uh, slime pits of water? No. What do you think they walked on? Yeah. Ritza. They didn't walk on the water. No. God pushed the water back. Abby? Like once the water dries up, there's like, it's just like dirt. Just but God had pushed the water back. Did, he, did they have, you think they had to wait for the water to dry up? No. No? Because God pushed it back. They walked across on dry ground. They walked across the river. Have you, none of us have walked across the river. We walked across a bridge across the river, right? But... <laughs> God pushed the water back for 16 miles and all 2 million people and their animals walked across the river while the priests stood in the middle of the river. Now, before they walked across, Joshua, Joshua called 12 men to him. Now, why did he call 12 men? Why did he call 12? Each of the men was from one of the tribes of Israel. He was a leader of the tribe of Israel. And, and there was 12 tribes of Israel, right? Like 12 states, kind of like. But 12 tribes of Israel. And he called these 12 men to him and said, when I give you the signal, I'm going to have something for you to do. So everybody gets across the river. And then Joshua says, okay, you 12 men, I want you to go out into the river near where the Ark of the Covenant is, where the priests are standing with the Ark of the Covenant. And I want you to get a big rock, one 
that you can carry on your shoulder. Okay, so I don't know how big that is, but it's not a little stone, right? Because we wouldn't get a rock this big and put it up on our shoulder, would we? So, but it's not this big because you we couldn't carry that on our shoulder. So, like this. Yeah, I know. Okay. So, but I don't know, maybe, maybe about this big. They get a rock, they pick it up, put it up on their shoulder so it's easy to carry. And 12 of these men get this rock and they bring it out of the river. And while they were doing that, Joshua went out to where the high priests were. And he got 12 stones, rocks that big, and he gathered them together into a monument, a pillar. Okay, so you see we have 12 stones out in where the water was, where the priests were, and 12 stones on the land next to uh, where the people of Israel were. And Joshua said to all the people, do you know why I had to get these 12 stones? And the people of Israel were like, hmm, why did Joshua have us get these 12 stones? Do you think you know why he had them get the 12 stones? I think because there's like, before there was like three, no, 12 Oh, you're thinking of Revelation. There's seven. Yeah, no. No. So, he had him get these 12 stones, and he had him put them in a big pile. He said, I'm, I'm doing this for two reasons. The first reason is so that when you're traveling around later on, and you see that big pile of stones, and you're with your family, and your kids, maybe your son, says to you, Dad, what is that pile of stones there for? I want you to remember that God dried up the river and made a way for us to walk across the river on dry ground. I want you to remember that our God is a real God who has all power and can do what is impossible. And there's a second reason. The second reason I'm having you set this pillar up is so that all the people who live in this land already, who don't who, who don't believe in the one true God, who worship idols, when they see this pillar, they will be reminded that there is a real God who has the power to roll water back from a river 16 miles wide. So Joshua set up those pillars. He set up the pillar in the river, and he set up the pillar there, and then he told the priest to come up out of the riverbed and so the priests walked, they had to stand there for a long time probably, didn't they? All day long, while everybody was coming across, they walked out of the river, and when they got up past where the water was before, what do you think happened? The water came back. The water came back through. Some people who don't really believe God has that kind of power will say, well, there was an earthquake upstream, and it blocked the river. Well, you wouldn't have dry ground to walk across if it just blocked the water, right? And if there was an earthquake up there that blocked the river, how would the water come back through when the people walked out, right? You know, we don't have to try to say that, you know, nature did this thing, right? It wasn't nature that dried the water up and filled the river back up. It was, who was it? It was God. God dried it up let them go across, and when, they, when the priest came out, God let the water come back through. Now, why do we tell, why, why does the Bible tell us this story? Why does the Bible tell us about this? I'm going to tell you again. It's kind of the same reason that Joshua set up these pillars. Why did Joshua set up the pillars? So that the Israelites would know would remember, so the Israelites would remember what God had done. Because when Joshua's great-grandchildren or, or great-great-great-grandchildren come around, and Joshua's dead, but they see that pillar, hopefully, what? Joshua's son would tell his son, and then his son would tell his son, and every time a family would go by that pillar, they would say, see that pillar? That reminds us that this river... God dried it up. And our forefathers 
Our grandfathers walked across on dry ground. So this is the same, that's some of the same reason that this story is in the Bible for us today. Do we need to walk across the Kaiman River? No. But sometimes, God asks us to do things and we think, I'm scared. Or, how am I going to do that? Aaron? Jackson? We might, we might say, I don't know what to do, or I don't know how I'm going to do that. And we should remember that God helped his people in the past. He told them to do something, and then he made it so it was possible to do it. We know that by reading the Bible, right? Lots of things in the Bible, not just this story. And the, these stories are in the Bible to, to help us do what we're supposed to do. And these stories are in the Bible so we can tell people who don't believe in God. There might be people who don't believe in God in the world. Is there people that don't believe in God in the world? Yes. And they might say, well, I don't even believe the Bible. But... The Bible is given to us to help us do what's right, and it's given to the world so that people who read the Bible say, if God can do that, he must be greater and more powerful than anybody here on the earth, and I think I ought to believe in him, right? I ought to believe what he says. So we have the Bible, and God, we find that God is faithful. The word faithful means that he does what he says, right? He keeps his promises. He said, go across the river, and even though it seemed impossible, he made it so that they, he helped them across the river, didn't he? And so when God tells us to do something, how does God tell us to do something? Does he speak from heaven like, Ian? Is that God's voice? No. How does Ian, or how does Cody, or how does Haley, or how does Kaylee, or how does Maddie, or how does Maritza, or how does Jackson, Jackson, or how do any of you hear God's voice? Do you hear it with your ear? No, but how do we hear, hear God's voice? Through the Bible. When we read the Bible, we can say, oh, that's to me, right? The Bible is written for each of us. It's written for Ian, but that doesn't mean it's not written for me. It's written for me, but that doesn't mean it's not written for you. We read the Bible, it says, to do something, we say, wow. That's hard. How can I do what the Bible tells me to do? God promises he is faithful. He will help us do what he has told us to do. Just like he helped the children of Israel get across the river. He said, go across the river. And so when they obeyed, he helped them get across the river, didn't he? And God helps us the same way. When we, every week we say... We thank God that he's given us his word, and we thank God that in the Bible is everything we need to, if we read and understand the Bible, and then do it, we can have a peaceful and joyful life. We might have trouble, we might have hard times, but we can still have peace in our heart and joy in our heart if we're doing what God tells us. And God tells us what to do in the Bible, it's up to us to do what God wants us to do, isn't it? And if it seems impossible, we should remember this story along with so many other things in the Bible that remind us that even if it seems impossible, God can do what seems impossible, can't you? Let's say that together. God can do what seems impossible. Let's try that again because we, I just... God can do what seems impossible. It might be impossible to us, but it only seems impossible because God, say it with me, can do what seems impossible.